God is good. All the time. God is good all the time. Good morning, church. Uh, my name is Mike. Uh, Mike is out of town, but he should be back uh, this afternoon. Welcome, visitors, if, uh, if you would. And you're visiting with us. We would like to thank you for joining us this morning. And please ask you to fill out a uh, card. And then you can lay it on the seat and or give it to one of us that uh, we may have a copy of your visit and we ask you to return at your most convenient time. Yesterday, our preacher got barbecued. Uh, he was the chef for all the hot dogs. How are you feeling this morning, brother? <laughs> Medium rare. All right. And uh, we had a lot of fun watching the kids uh, fish. One little guy who was seven, he caught 13. And then after the competition was over, I don't know how many more he caught. Uh, he was the grandson of one of our widows, uh, Nolan Meininger. And so uh, he was, he did not want to eat. So we had to force him to come in and, well, I don't know if he ate anything, but he sat there for five or ten minutes. And then when we cleared him to go back, he went right back and started catching fish. <coughs> One of our young people also decided to go swimming in the pond. And she's with us this morning, hiding behind Larry. <laughs> uh, this was after everything was done. But we had, we had a great time yesterday. And, I want to thank all those who were there uh, to, to help out, who brought food, who cooked, and uh, uh, it was, we had good weather. It was a little warm, but we had, we had really good weather, uh, great turnout, um, and all the trophies were given. So uh, thank you. Thank you so much. So our next big event is probably going to be our... Well, we're going to have, uh, well, we have David coming. We have a end of life seminar uh, coming in October. And then, is it? End of life. <coughs> and uh, that's going to be, we're, we're actually getting that all together. And so we're going to invite you to that as well. And then we also have our trunk or treat and then the apple butter Bible bowl batch coming in November, so we have a lot of things going on, and uh, just keep that in mind. This afternoon, we have an elders, deacons, preachers meeting, and so, uh, fellas, be aware of that. Um, as far as the bulletin is concerned, make sure you pick one up and read it, please. There are uh, announcements in there as well as some really good articles. And if you have an announcement that you would like to make and it's not in the bulletin, please make sure you give it to uh, Mike or myself or one of the elders so that we can get it, we can announce it from, from the uh, pulpit. So without any further comments, let us remove the world from our minds and focus on our Father, His Majesty, and Lord. Okay? <coughs> He will be called Wonderful Elder. <coughs> we like for you to stand for the first <coughs> Thank you. 
support us today. We have to serve you, Lord. We pray that you uh, watch over the church. We pray that you uh, somehow reach out to those who don't want to be here, who choose not to be here. Enlighten them in a way that they find the need to be here, Lord. Pray that you be with the sick that couldn't be here, Lord. Put your healing hands upon them. Thank you for this country we live in. Thank you for the, that we can <coughs> serve you, Lord, freely. We pray that you uh, put those in charge this fall. And what uh, people that will lead this country in the direction that you want it to go, Lord. Pray that you help us grow the church. Pray that people open their eyes and realize that you are the one and only true Lord. And thank you for everything, especially Jesus. It's in his blessed name we pray. Amen. <coughs> As we gather around the table to remember our Lord's sacrifice for all mankind, the song that we had just sung stated several times the reason why our Lord and Savior <coughs> went there. And it was made person, uh, personal in the lyrics of the, of the song. It was not only for us, but in the song it stated it was for me. And if we, we include that in our own personal being, we can see how personal his sacrifice was. 
In the scripture reading that was given prior to the song, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten son, the world, all mankind, but then we sing about a personal salvation. Even if there was only one man on this earth, Jesus would have died for that one man to bring him back or her into God's love and favor. The night before he died, he instituted this memorial feast. <coughs> he became the Passover lamb that was predicted for centuries. And with that feast, he had the whole world on his shoulders. The world that had been, the world that was, and the world that was to come after he had walked this earth and was raised from the dead and went back to his father. All the nauseous sins of mankind. But it was for me that Jesus died. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we thank you so much for your courage. Knowing full well the destiny that uh, you had when you came to this earth. <coughs> for walking the paths of, of manhood as a baby, a toddler, a child, a teen, and an adult. <coughs> Living in the shadow of the cross, and yet teaching, preaching, and loving and giving us an example to follow. <coughs> As we surround this table and remember you, we ask your blessings on the emblem representing the body that you gave on the cross for our salvation and the salvation of all men. And we pray that as we partake that we would be spiritually strengthened and be aware of your sacrifice, not only in these few minutes, but in the days ahead. We thank you for instituting this so that we can remember and reflect. For it is in your name we pray. Amen. Lord, as we continue to remember your sacrifice, we ask your blessings on this cup, which so richly represents the blood that you gave for our salvation and freedom. The blood that was full of love, patience, long-suffering, Father, we also thank you for sending your Son to give us the redemption and the hope that was needed to buy us back. <coughs> and we pray for those who are outside these walls who don't know you, that we have an opportunity to reach out to them and to show them your love not only by word also, but by example. And we pray this in your son's holy name.
It was for me that Jesus died. And God loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. So we're instructed each first day of the week to not only partake and remember the Lord, but also to give as we have been prospered. And this is nothing new. It was nothing new to the Jewish Christians at the time, the first converts, because they had been giving throughout the centuries in the, uh, in the Old Testament <coughs> with the building of the, the um, tabernacle and then the temple <coughs> and then with their sacrifices. So we're commanded each first day of the week to give. And a lot of people can, you know, can talk about how much to give and there's been so much debate and discussion. But we live under a law of grace, not under the law of Moses. So God leaves it up to us as individuals to give back, to expand the word, to maintain the word uh, so that people would know it and learn it. And so not only of our money, but of our time and of our talent and our abilities, because who gave us those? The Lord himself. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, sometimes we don't know how to address you. We thank you for everything that uh, you have given to us. We thank you for the abilities <coughs> that you have given each and every one of us for the body which brings us together as like believers in your son and in you. And we ask that as we have purposed in our hearts, have been prospered, we pray that uh, what we give back to you would be pleasing and acceptable that your name would be glorified and honored, that those who would be recipients of this, this gifts, that your word may prosper and expand. We thank you for the opportunity of not only being able to speak to you in the avenue of prayer, but also because of the sacrifice of your son. And with that, we pray that you help us to be living sacrifices, <coughs> that uh, your name would be honored and glorified. We thank you for this opportunity, for it is in your Son's high and holy name, our Redeemer, our King, our Brother, in his name.
This morning in the passage we'll be preaching from is Matthew chapter 9, verses 35 through 38. And Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless and like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful. But the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Please be seated. It is good to be back with you again, church. I, I got to say, I, I'm so happy to be back. It was wonderful being with, what was it, 5,100 New Testament Christians all in one big room singing praises and learning together. It was a fantastic time at polishing the pulpit, uh, but it is, it is so good to be home with, with my congregation, with my people. And I, I missed you all. I hope, I hope you feel the same way. Anywho, this morning our, our lesson is entitled The Lord of the Harvest. To get into this morning's lesson, uh, and as we try to do each Lord's Day, we want to look to Jesus as the author and the perfecter of our faith. We want to look to him from uh, his example. We want to learn from him. We want to try, try and follow in his footsteps. That should be our, our job. That's what we want to seek to do. <coughs> and as we look at this passage this morning, it, I believe it lays out for us four pretty straightforward ways in which we can better follow Jesus. Do we want to follow Jesus? Do we, do we really want to do that? Do we want to actually follow in his footsteps? Remember what Jesus said about following him. He had some pretty stern words that accompanied uh, following him. It, it involves picking up a cross. It involves dying daily. That's what following Jesus involves, but we got to make sure we're ready for that commitment. And as we make that commitment, we're going to see four ways that we can follow Jesus, emulate his example, and that sort of thing. Today I want to see these four things. Number one, we want to see where Jesus went. Number two, we want to see what Jesus did when he went there. Number three, we want to see what Jesus saw, his worldview, his outlook on the situation. And lastly, we want to see what Jesus said. We want to see where he went, what he did, what he saw, and what he said. And as we examine our text this morning, I want to point out something to you that I think is important uh, as we consider what Jesus has to say in this particular passage. If we look to the very next chapter, something that occurred fairly uh, quickly after what we're going to, to read today, we see in chapter 10, 
that he calls the 12 disciples to himself and then he sends them out to go and reap the harvest that we're going to be talking about today in chapter 9. What we're looking at today is kind of like the last couple of classes before you would have your final exam. Remember back in school when you know, it was final exam time, the quarter is ending, or the, the year end is, uh, the class year is coming to an end, and finals are upon you, and you're cramming, and you get that last little bit of information, the teacher says, you have to know this right here, if you're going to be successful and pass this class. That's kind of what, what we're looking at here. Jesus is giving his last little teachings and examples before he finally sends out his disciples to try it for themselves, and to do it for themselves. So it's important for us to understand what Jesus is saying and doing and training his disciples to do here in this text. So first, I want to go ahead and look at verse 35 from two different perspectives. The first one is going to cover, as we said earlier, where Jesus went. Look at verse 35 once more with me. <clears throat> and Jesus went throughout all the cities and the villages. We're going to stop right there. Jesus went throughout all the cities and all the villages. One of the first things we have to uncover about this is just what the text says. Jesus went. Jesus actually went somewhere. He, he got off his backside and went somewhere to go talk to people. He took the initiative to go to where the people were. Now, when you're planning a trip, you plan on going somewhere. What do you do? You, you plan. There's some forethought involved. You don't just start walking one day and you randomly end up in a location. Then you think about, where is it that I'm going to go today? Where is my destination? How am I going to get there? What do I anticipate happening once I get there? Jesus had forethought. He thought about where he was going to go and then he got up and went. He did not wait for the crowds to come to him. Though he, he has done that in the past and he very well could have done that throughout his entire ministry. He was Jesus after all. He was drawing crowds to himself because of the miracles and all the wonderful things that he did and all the good works and all that. He could have drawn a crowd just sitting where he was. But what did he choose to do? He chose to get up and he chose to go. See, we're going with this church. We have to follow Jesus in this way and be willing to take the initiative and go where the people are at. Now, it's something interesting about this word went. The, the Greek language is so rich. There's wonderful little nuggets here and there, but this word went carries with it the sense of teaching people how to follow where you're going. He went with, with the thought in mind that I'm going to show my disciples how to do this, how to go from place to place, how to, to figure out where you're going to go and what you're going to do. I think that's interesting and also worth noting. Now I propose again, he was teaching his type of disciples how to go around from place to place and do this wonderful work. But Jesus went, but where did he go? Did he just wander out in the desert? Did he, did he have no plan in mind? No, he had a purpose in mind where he was going to go. And the text tells us he went to all the cities and to all the villages. Now, if you look a little bit more closely at the languages here, what it's, what it's basically saying is he went to walled places of living and unwalled places of living. Now, that might not mean a whole lot to us in our, in our modern society, in our civilization. We have towns like Dover and New Philly and that sort of thing. But what we're getting at here is you had walled cities, which were places that had the money to build a wall to protect the city. It was a, a place that was a little, bit, a little bit higher class, perhaps, we might say. And he also went to the places that couldn't afford a wall to protect their city. The lower class areas. He did not discriminate to only going to the upper crust people, the people in the walled cities who could afford to live in such a place. He also went to those, those little dinky towns out in the middle of nowhere that couldn't afford to protect themselves. He went to all kinds of places. He made no discrimination of one place over another. He went to every place that he could go. He maximized his opportunities to reach someone. He went everywhere with a purpose. He didn't discriminate based on where the person lived. And every person of every place was a candidate for hearing what he had to say. Every person of every place. And as we consider Jesus and how we want to be more like him in this area, here's some things that we can do. We need to give some forethought to where we're going in our day-to-day -day life. A lot of times we just kind of get into that autopilot mode, don't we? 
Say, I've got this and this and this I've got to get done today. I, I just got to get those boxes checked. I'm done with my day and all that sort of thing. Think about it. Am I going to the store today? Or maybe tomorrow. Tomorrow's grocery day. It's starting of the week. I got to get all my groceries for the week. Where are you planning on going? You're planning on going to the grocery store. Do you go to the same grocery store virtually every time you go out to get groceries? Do you see the same cashiers every time you go there to get your groceries? If you start thinking about these things and you're adopting the mindset of Jesus and you say, well, I'm going to encounter so-and-so, I can almost bet on it. I'm going to have something to share with them. We took the opportunities to get <coughs> everywhere looking for these opportunities. Think about how you might be able to reach someone for Christ as you go throughout your day to day. It takes some forethought. We need to maximize our opportunities to reach someone. How do we do that? Well, do what Jesus did. He didn't discriminate against who he was going to share the word with. He didn't discriminate based on their, their socioeconomic status in society. He went to the walled and the unwalled towns, as it were. He went to the high class places and the low class places. There was nobody off limits to hearing what he had to say. And we can do this in, a, in another way. We need, we need to make sure that we don't discriminate based on how we think a person might react <coughs> to what we have to say. You might look at somebody who looks pretty disheveled and out of it and that sort of thing and say, there's no way that person is going to give me the time of day. There's no way that person wants to have anything to do with Christ in this church. I'm not even going to bother trying. They don't look like the type of people would want to hear anything about Christianity. If we have that mindset and we we do that, then we are then discriminating against them. We're making the decision to not follow Christ for them. We can't do that. And that's what we need to make up our minds beforehand that we are going to reach someone before we even meet them. When we wake up in the morning, when we get ready to go from place to place, as we do each and every day, we need to make up in our mind, I commit to trying to reach somebody today. Do we make that commitment? When our feet hit the floor in the morning, do we make that commitment? I want to reach somebody today. Even if it's some small, insignificant way, I'm going to make that effort today. Hopefully we can all make that commitment. So Jesus went from place to place. He went to village, to city, and all the places in between. But what did Jesus do when he went there? Let's go back to our Bibles and look at verse 35 once more. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages doing what? Teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and affliction. So after Jesus went where he was going, what did he begin doing? Teaching, proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and and affliction. Let's start with this first one. The first thing Jesus did in our text here. Jesus taught in the synagogues. What did he teach? Well, if you look elsewhere in scriptures, he, he taught the word of God. He elaborated on, this, on the scriptures. He brought clarity to the word of God. And he brought instructions on how people were to follow it. What they, they were to be looking for. That's what Jesus taught. What else did he do? Well, he taught in the synagogues. What does that mean? When we think of synagogue, what, what comes to mind? A lot of times you might think of something kind of like what we're doing right here, a church service of sorts, an Old Testament church service. Well, in a lot of cases, that was the case. But a synagogue wasn't limited only to worship. A synagogue wasn't limited only to gathering together for the purpose of reading the Torah or whatever. The synagogue was just where the people were gathered. You remember in, uh, I believe it's John chapter 9, with the blind man who was going to be thrown out of the synagogue? It was much more than just getting kicked out of church. He was going to lose his, all of his societal connections. This was the, the gathering place where the people came together to, to learn and discuss and to worship and everything. The synagogue was everything. And so what this is basically saying is not only did Jesus go where people worshipped, he just went to where the people were. He met people where they were at, literally. <laughs> Where are the people that you encounter in your day-to-day -day life? Is it your workplace? Is it your family? Is it out at the grocery store? Is it at the restaurant? Where are the people at that you can reach? Jesus taught the word of God where the people were. 
He brought clarity, instruction, and all of those wonderful things. What else did Jesus do? Jesus preached the gospel of the kingdom. What is the gospel of the kingdom? The gospel is what? The death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, right? We, we know that, but what is this gospel of the kingdom? Do we know what that is? Well, let me tell you, church, the, the Jews of his day certainly knew what the gospel of the kingdom of what was, and it was good news to them, and it really is good news to us as well. Let's get into this a little bit more closely. Jesus was preaching this gospel of the kingdom as something that the Jews understood and were very excited about. That's because there is a prophecy, there is a prophecy in the book of Daniel that talked about this, this kingdom uh, that Jesus preached on. See, in the book of Daniel, there were four great kingdoms that were prophesied to come into the world. And Daniel is talking to the Babylonian king. He says, great king, you are the first kingdom. You are the first kingdom. And after Babylon, the next kingdom that came about was the next great kingdom of the world were the Medo-Persian kingdoms. They're kind of tied together there. The third kingdom was the Greeks. And the Greeks were the Greeks. We'll just stop at that. But who followed the Greek empire? It was that fourth kingdom. It was Rome. It was Rome. It was that great empire that filled the whole earth, as it were, and that uh, the Jewish people were subjected to. And Daniel says in Daniel chapter 2, 44, it's in the days of those kings, that fourth great world kingdom that would rule over all the earth. He says, in the days of those kings, the God of heaven will set up a kingdom that shall never be destroyed. Nor shall the kingdom be left to another people. But it shall break all these kingdoms in pieces and bring them to an end. And it shall stand forever. Now what is it? What happens with kingdoms? They rise and fall. They're destroyed. Other kingdoms come in and conquer them and destroy what was there. They, they do that sort of thing. Sometimes kingdoms are left to another people or other people come in and just take what was already established. But that's not the case with this kingdom of God. The gospel of the kingdom that Jesus is proclaiming. This kingdom would be one that was established and would stay established and be established forever. Forever. This was something the Jewish people were very, very excited about. They were looking for their kingdom to be restored and to take over and they would be the conquerors. And that's what they had in mind when Jesus was preaching these things. But Jesus is proclaiming the good news that this kingdom is now at hand. It, it's here. This kingdom that you've been looking forward to for, for centuries and centuries and centuries, it's here. And you need to be a part of it. That's the, that's the gospel, the good news of the kingdom of God. That's what he was preaching. Now here's what I think, what I personally find to be interesting when I read this. When I consider the kingdoms and how kingdoms are established. How are kingdoms normally established? Under a typical cir circumstance. What usually happens? Well, oftentimes... Uh, one kingdom that exists is then taken over by another kingdom by force and violence and oppression and, and that sort of method. You saw that with the Babylonians, the Medes, Persians, the Greeks, and the Romans. They would come in and they'd sack the kingdom and they'd take over and then they would establish their kingdom, their empire. But Jesus, after announcing the gospel of the kingdom, then goes on to show us how this kingdom, the kingdom of God, would conquer and take over the world. This is what is it's so interesting to me. How does he demonstrate how this kingdom takes over? What does he do? Look at verse 35 once more. And proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction. He shows us how this kingdom takes over by doing what? By serving. He goes on to heal every disease and every affliction that he comes across. He found the hurts around him and he healed them. He found the needs that people had and he met them. There was nothing before him that he refused to help with. There was nothing beneath him. He demonstrated that this kingdom, unlike the others of the world, would not be built off the backs of conquered people through oppression and violence and that sort of things. This kingdom would be built through selfless sacrifice through service 
and through love. Very different from any other kingdom of the world. And he demonstrated that through his life and service. So here's what we can do. As we examine what Jesus did here, here's what we can do. Well, first we need to establish this. There are things that Jesus did that we just simply cannot do. Before we get any wild ideas, we can't do everything Jesus did. Jesus <coughs> performed many miracles, the likes of which could not be recorded in all the books of the world. He did wonderful, wonderful things of a miraculous nature that we can't do. But here's what we can do. We can work to heal hurts. We can work to heal hurts. Are you hurting? Do you know anybody who is? I think if we stop and pause for just two seconds, we could identify a whole list of people who are, who are hurting in this world. Whether that's physically, emotionally, spiritually. We can think of somebody hurting, and is there anything within our power that we can do to help lend a hand to them, to relieve some of that hurt in their life? Anything at all. Now, I know there are limitations to that, but certainly we can think of some way that we can heal some of those hurts. What about meeting needs? Is there anybody that comes to mind when you think, do I know anybody who has a need Legitimate need. Whether that's food, clothing, maybe some financial assistance. What about some company? Does anybody ever get lonely? You need some company? You need some fellowship? You need some time together with somebody who cares? Do you know anybody who has a need like that? And Jesus did. Jesus met that need. And certainly we can follow in his footsteps in that way. <coughs> What else did Jesus do? He preached the gospel. Can we do that? Can we preach the gospel? Do we know what it is? And can we tell it to somebody? Well, hopefully each one of us know what the gospel is because each one of us have obeyed it and believed it and have been saved by it and we stand upon it. Hopefully that's the case. And if we have that much, we have enough to tell somebody it. But maybe we don't know what the gospel is and we need to reassess that situation. Can we go where the people are and teach them? Do you, do you encounter people in your day-to-day -day life? Do you encounter people regularly that you could share a word about the Lord with them? Now when I say go teach the people, I don't necessarily mean that we have to go stand in front of a great crowd somewhere and proclaim some big elaborate sermon or, or preach a big lesson or, or have a class of you know, six parts figured out. We don't have to do that. It can be as simple as this, church. Do you mind if I tell you what I learned about Jesus this week? Have you learned anything about Jesus this week? I'm asking the church. Have you learned anything about Jesus this week in your personal studies or in the congregational setting? Have you learned anything about Jesus in the last month, in the last year, in the last 10 years? Now, do you have the ability to say to somebody, hey, do you mind if I share this with you? I learned this about Jesus. I think it's pretty cool. Do you mind if I share that? Are you capable of that? I don't think there's a soul in here who could say, no, I'm not capable of sharing something that I learned about Jesus in the last year. Certainly we can all do that. We need to go where the people are. Maybe it's a family member, a friend, co-worker, whatever. But we need to go where the people are and share Jesus with them. Number three, what Jesus saw. As he went about and as he did his teaching and healing and all those great things that he did, what did Jesus see? Look at verse 36 with me. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. What did Jesus see? We're looking at Jesus' worldview, his view of people now. And he looked at people and he looked at the world in a very particular way. And this is the, the view that we need to each adopt in our own lives. When we look at the world around us, when we look at all the people around us, this is the view that we need to adopt. <coughs> Jesus saw the people as being harassed, helpless, and without a shepherd. Now how are the people harassed? When Jesus looked at the people and he made his assessment and concluded that people were being harassed, what did he have in mind? Well, a few things. 
They were harassed by the Roman occupiers, certainly. They were people subjected to a, an outside governing body that wasn't of God, and, and that wasn't a good thing. They were harassed in that way. They were most definitely harassed by their religious leaders. The Pharisees, the scribes, the Sadducees, all, all of that. Those, those people, those religious elite, looked down on the common people as just scum. Worthless people not to be associated with. And so they were harassed in that way. And no doubt they were also harassed by Satan. <coughs> the spiritual element of all this. The, the great adversary who roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Harassed by the devil, certainly. And of course the sin that often accompanies the, the temptations and the afflictions caused by Satan. He saw the people as being harassed by all of those things. He saw the people as being helpless. The language here bears out they were, that they were viewed as just people who had been thrown away like garbage. Refuge tossed to the side of the road, thrown down into the dirt with no one who's going to come along and fix their situation or lend a helping hand. Helpless. What comes with that? When you're helpless, a lot of times hopeless comes along with that situation. And thirdly, he viewed the people as being shepherdless. Sheep without a shepherd don't fare well, do they? They roam around aimlessly. They have no one to lead them, to tell them where they need to go, to direct them into the green pastures and the still waters. They'll die without a shepherd. What else does it mean to be shepherdless? It means that they have nobody to feed them. Nobody to care for their needs. To nourish them both physically but certainly spiritually. <coughs> nobody to meet their needs and feed them. Nobody to protect them. What did shepherds often do? They, they kept the wolves and the lions and the bears and, and all that at bay. They protected the sheep from, from harm from the outside. Nobody to protect them. These people were left exposed and vulnerable and helpless, thrown away to the side and harassed constantly. By those who should have cared for them, the religious leaders, by their government that should have cared for them. Harassed by Satan and sin and temptation and guilt and shame. And because Jesus had this view of people, what did he have for them? What's our text say? Go back to verse 36. When he saw the crowds, he saw their situation, he had compassion for them. Compassion. What does that mean in this biblical sense? It means that he felt such deep empathy for them and their situation that it made him sick to his stomach. The word bears that out. It's like a, your stomach is in painful knots. It turns within you when you look at what's happening. Have you ever witnessed something just so horrific or so frightening? That it just turns your stomach over inside of you. You've seen a really bad accident. You've seen a plane crash or something. You see all the people in turmoil running around frantic. And, and you look at that situation and you're just sick to your stomach. That's what Jesus felt when he looked at the situation of these helpless, hopeless, shepherdless people. And oh, by the way, we were all once those people when we were outside of Christ. We were helpless we were hopeless, we were harassed and shepherdless. But then Jesus came along in compassion, had mercy on us, and made us whole, gave us all of those things that we lacked, gave us protection as our great shepherd. He, he gave us compassion. He redeemed us. He did so many things for us. We don't have time to get into all of it. But this was what Jesus experienced when he saw all those people, when he saw us. And so when we think about Jesus and his outlook, his viewpoint of all these people, we need to stop and reflect and think, how do we view people? When we look out at the world around us, we see people in their situation apart from Christ. Is our reaction like Jesus' reaction to them? Because how we view people is going to dictate how we respond to them and their situation. Do we look at our friends, our family, our neighbors are all living apart from God, and we all have people in that situation, don't we? We look at those people, and does it turn our stomach with pity for them? 
We look at them, we assess their situation, we know what their future is apart from Christ. It doesn't make, it, make us sick to our stomachs to think about their end. <coughs> it did with Jesus and not to with us. After looking at all this, looking at the situation after Jesus did all that he did, after going all the places that he went and all of that, Jesus then turns to his disciples and he has something to say. And what he says to his disciples here applies certainly to them. By extension, it's, it applies to us as well as those who claim to follow Christ. Look at verses 37 and 38. And then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Jesus said the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. The abundance of opportunities to bring people into the fold is there. This is Jesus' view of the situation. Now, when we listen to Jesus speaking here and he says the harvest is plentiful, do we turn and say, yeah, right? <coughs> you really think so? Do you live where I live? Nobody wants to hear about Jesus. Nobody cares about Christianity. Nobody cares about the church. You mean to tell me the harvest is plentiful? I'd say sparse at best. Is that how we react? When we hear these words of Jesus, do we really believe that the harvest is plentiful? Or Jesus says elsewhere, wait unto harvest. Do we really believe in what he says that? We ought to because that's Jesus' view of the situation. He seems to think when he looks out at the world and sees all of these people, that there are more people to bring in than there are people to bring them in. When we look at Dover around us, do we, do we really believe there are more people here in Dover to be brought into the fold, to be brought into Christ's church. So much so that we don't even have enough people to do that. What an abundance of opportunities must there really be. That's God's view. The Son of God. That was His view of, of the situation. There's more opportunities than people to meet the need. But since that's the case, since it is the case, and Jesus has told us this fact, and it is truth because He's told us this, since it's the case that there are more people to be brought in than people to bring them in, what does he say for his disciples to do? Pray. 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 And pray earnestly to God for one specific thing. What is that thing, church? Let's look at our text once more. <clears throat> Verse 38. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord to send out laborers into his harvest. Now, Jesus said to his disciples to pray earnestly to that end, to pray to the Lord earnestly that he would send laborers out into his harvest. And in doing so, Jesus has just put every disciple into the hot seat. Here's what I mean by that. He says, pray that the Lord would send laborers into the harvest. Now, if you are a disciple of Jesus Christ, and you take his words to heart and you say, yes, Lord, I believe that there is an abundance of people to be brought in in this great harvest. I believe that is a need. It needs to be met. I commit to praying earnestly that you would send workers out into your field to bring out that harvest. If we commit to praying that and all the while refuse to be that worker. We refuse to be that one that God sends. How consistent are we being? We say, yes, Lord, it's a great need. I believe you. It's, it's out there. It needs to be done. You need people. I'm praying fervently. I'm praying earnestly that you would send somebody but make it somebody else. Not me. Send anybody else, but not me. How inconsistent is that? Is that going to hold up in God's court? No, it's not. God is said to be the Lord of this heart. <coughs> that, gives, that gives me tremendous hope, church. God is said to be the Lord of this harvest. What does that mean? The Lord of the harvest? Well, the Lord is the sovereign one. He's the one who has control over it. He is the one in other, other places. Remember Paul said, I planted a polished water, but God gave the increase. The Lord of the harvest is the one who makes the harvest grow. He's the one who dictates when and where it grows. He's the one who dictates when it's ready to be harvested. He is the Lord of the harvest. His hand is over the whole process. And if God's hand is over the whole process, you can guarantee success, can't you? Guaranteed success. 
God's fields are never barren. Since he is Lord of the harvest, they never suffer famine. There's never a blight. And if there's a lack of harvest, it's not because God has not provided it. It's because laborers have not committed to going into the fields and harvesting it. There's a lack of harvest. It's, it lies squarely on our shoulders. Secondly, this, this is God's harvest. He's the Lord of the harvest. And we're to pray that people would send people into his harvest. It's his harvest. What does that mean? It means it belongs to him. The things that are harvested, we're talking about people here, belong to him. And so when we commit to this harvest, harvesting work, we need to ask, who are we really reaping or harvesting for? Are we harvesting for God and his glory and his kingdom and his people alone? Or is our selfish motivation and ambition tied in there somewhere? We need to be aware of that. We need to be careful about that. What titles does Jesus give those who reap God's harvest? <coughs> what word does he associate with those who go out and do this? Laborers. Workers. What am I getting at? Laborers and workers are sent. That means it doesn't just happen on its own. It doesn't just happen on its own. It takes effort. It takes time and energy, and planning, and forethought. It's work. It's a labor. We should all be committed to it. And while we may not all support this work in the same capacity, not everybody in here is going to hold a sickle. You go out and start doing that reaping. But the people who do hold the sickle, they need support. They need help. They need nourishment. They need provisions. They need encouragement to do that work. While we all have our own ways that we, we can contribute to that, we need to commit to contributing to that great work of the harvest. So I want to ask you this morning as we wrap up our lesson, will you commit today to being a part of this work? Will you commit to that? Will you pray earnestly for it, that God would send those laborers? We, we can at least do that much, can't we, church? Pray that God would earnest, pray earnestly to God that He would send laborers into this harvest, especially here. That we all commit to that. Does your view of people match Jesus' view of people? As we reflect upon this harvest that Jesus has spoken about, do we look at people as helpless, harassed, and without a shepherd, needing of guidance and care and love? Are you willing to share what you've learned about Jesus with others? Are you willing to look for hurts and try and heal them to the best of your abilities? Are you willing to meet the needs of the people around you to the best of your abilities? Do you know the good news of Jesus? Are you willing to share with somebody? I learned this about Jesus this week. Do you mind if I tell you what I learned? Are you willing to do that? I want to see you to keep our eyes open for opportunities as we go about our day to day. Consider who you might come across and who you might share Jesus with. What it is you might share. <coughs> and commit to making that practice both this week and really forever. That's what we're called to do. If you're here this morning and you're not yet a Christian, I want you to consider how Jesus feels towards you. We talked about that at length already this morning. How Jesus feels towards you was one moved with compassion to the point of dying on a cross to save you from your sins. What a wonderful, merciful Savior. On the cross, Jesus healed our greatest hurt and met our greatest need. He removed from us our guilt and shame from sin and provided us salvation from the wrath of God. That's available to you this morning. He promises us the forgiveness of our sins and a new life with him when we are buried with him and raised with him in baptism. And of course, we're always willing to serve you in that capacity. Uh, make, sure you, make sure you do it. If you're a Christian already, but you're harboring sin in your heart, ill will towards brethren, you have a, a mindset on worldly things. You're more focused on the things of this world rather than the things of God, the things that are above that we're commanded to set our minds upon. And we need to repent, and we want to encourage you to repent and be refreshed by the blood of Jesus Christ this morning. It's a wonderful offer that's open to us. Let's take advantage of it while it's, while it's time.
If you have any needs this morning, if you need some love, encouragement, prayers, support, to be restored, to repent, or whatever, we want to we want to serve you this morning. You can come forward while we're standing so. Sister Ruth comes forward this morning, and uh, she's she was struggling, is struggling, and could really use some prayers and encouragements from her brothers and sisters in Christ this morning. Uh, there's been a lot of big life changes for Ruth in the past a couple of months, really, the loss of her son. And some other family issues that have cropped up in the recent days. It's causing a lot of stress and, and heartache and hardship on her. And uh, if we would all commit to trying to be an encouragement to Ruth, even more so uh, in the coming days. I'm, I'm sure she would be appreciative of that. I'd be appreciative of that. But we'd like to turn and go to our Father now on her behalf and have a prayer for her. If you would all bow with me. Loving Father in heaven, you are so good to us and you pour out on us grace and mercy each day of our life. We're so thankful that you've provided the blood of Christ for us that we can continually be cleansed of our, our sins, our shortcomings, and the times that we just don't live up to your standard. Father, we know that this life is difficult. You know this life is difficult for us, and we try our very best. But sometimes the frustrations and hardships of this life just overcome us, and we stumble and fall. Father, I'd like to lift up our sister Ruth now and... and uh, Ask that you would give her forgiveness. We ask that you would look at her contrite heart and her willingness to come forward and share her, her griefs and her sorrows with all of us. And you would just abundantly bless her, Father. Help her to know just how much she is loved. Help us to be a, an even better source of encouragement for her and uh, to help her meet any needs that she might have and Heal any hurts that she might have. Help us to be good brothers and sisters to our Lord. Father, forgive all of us. We know uh, how, how that struggle can be. And uh, we often all fall short when, when we encounter those things. We love you, Lord, and we thank you. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>
Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to come here, sing praises, and worship you. We'd also like you to be with Ruth as she's continuing, continuing with her struggles. We ask you to, uh, for your uh, strength and your wisdom, not only for her, but for all of us, so we can uh, use that in our daily lives to help encourage a, a better walk with you and also we can use that your strength and your wisdom to help bring other people closer to you lord we thank you so much for the blessings we get we have each and every day of our lives in jesus name we pray amen <laughs> Thank you. 